So now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce today's distinguished speaker, Dr. Timnit Gabru, for her talk, uh, The Quest for Ethical AI. Uh, Dr. Gabru is the founder and executive director of the Distributed Artificial Intelligence Research Institute, which she launched in December of 2021 to create an environment for AI research that is independent from the structures and systems that incentivize profit over ethics and individual well being. She, uh, previously, she served as co lead of Google's ethical AI research team. And her uh, departure from the company helped shine a light on ethical AI practices at Google and beyond. Uh, Dr. Gabru is known in part for her groundbreaking research related, relating to racial bias in AI algorithms. Uh, in 2018, she co-authored a study that exposed the gender and racial biases embedded in facial recognition technologies by showing how these systems uh, are less accurate at, at identifying both women and people of color. She's also a co-founder of Black and AI, a nonprofit that works to increase the presence, inclusion, visibility, and health of Black people in the field of AI. She's on the board of Addis Coder, a nonprofit dedicated to teaching algorithms and computer programming to Ethiopian high school students free of charge. And she was named one of nature's 10 people who helped shape science in 2021. Uh, she received her doctorate from Stanford University, uh, completed a postdoc at Microsoft Research in New York City in the Fairness, Accountability, Transparency, and Ethics in AI group. And we are appreciative of her, of her work and thrilled to have her join us today as today's uh, distinguished speaker. So Dr. Gabru, welcome. Thanks. Um, thanks for having me and for that introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, Okay, so today I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the Distributed AI Research Institute, which is an institute that I started. Um, in, and we launched it in December uh, 2021, uh, so if, just a couple of months ago. And I just wanted to talk about why, um, what the different components of the institute that I um, thought about are uh, be, as they relate to ethical AI, because one of the things I've noticed is that um, in this discussion on ethical AI, um, we focus on a number of things, but I always come back to the incentive structures that we have and how if we don't have, if we don't bake in the right incentive structures, we're always gonna end up uh, with the same um, kind of product, which is either a lot of money going into AI related technology for warfare or a lot of money going into um, AI related technology in the hands of a few corporations having outsized influence and control around the world. Um, and many times both of those um, kind of intersecting, right? If you look at like World War II, for instance, and Silicon Valley's rule or MIT being the second largest military contractor. Um, so anyhow, um, so DARE stands for the Distributed AI Research Institute. And um, the reason uh, that it's distributed is uh, because um, I'm gonna remove self-view, sorry. It's just like so distracting <laughs> to look at yourself um, talking while you're giving this um, presentation, much better now. So um, DARE is, uh, it stands for Distributed um, AI Research Institute, um, not DARE, like one of the names I was thinking about was DARE, DARE. DA like <laughs> for the institute, but uh, that would be like milk products, which is not what 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 we're um, trying to do. Except that some somebody tagged us accidentally on Twitter while they were talking about cows and milk, and I had to be like, no, that's not who we are. We're dare. Um, and um, the first word that came to my mind when I was uh, thinking about uh, what to do next. Um, and it, I had been thinking about an independent institute for a while was distributed. And the reason being that um, I noticed when we were, at, when I was at Google and we had this ethical AI team, it was quite distributed around the world. And I think, I think we covered almost all time zones. And um, there was just no way we could have certain insights um, if we didn't hire people in certain locations and certain places, because, um, you know, you can't get people to care about problems that they don't vis viscerally, viscerally experience. So for instance, one of these people 
that the last person I hired into our team two weeks before I got fired was um, El Mahdi El Mahamdi. He's a, a Moroccan uh, researcher. He's um, he lives in uh, Switzerland. He's a he's a professor in theoretical computer science uh, science, um, and he works on robustness. But he was also a journalist um, during the Arab Spring, and you know he won an award. And recently, um, his friends, other journalists, have been imprisoned in Morocco. Um, and uh, one of his friends, Omar Radi, uh, was one of the first known cases, actually victims of the Pegasus um, spyware that you may all know about. And um, uh, Mahdi was getting so many threats on YouTube, on um, Twitter, on Facebook. Um, and he was raising an alarm at Google about how the, the biggest channel in Morocco was basically a, an, an arm of the government's intelligence wing and they were using it to harass dissidents, et cetera. And we just couldn't get anybody to care about this um, at even at Google on YouTube. Um, and so that kind of issue that's extremely important would only you know come to fore if we have people like him, right? So that's why I want to make sure that people from around the world can um, impact the way in which um, technology is being built because these few handful organizations that are based in like one location are having an outsized influence in the entire world. Um, and, and another example is that I was born and raised in Ethiopia and right now there is an, a, a one a basic, probably the worst war of the 21st century um, in, in Tigray in the Northern um, state of Ethiopia and um, uh, uh, an estimated 500,000 people have died just in the last 16 months. And right now we are getting reports of um, professors um, dying of hunger. Uh, there is a blockade. Um, so hunger is being used as a weapon of war. A journalist fainting in their studios. Um, and uh, so uh, doctors fainting while treating patients. And when I was at Google, um, one month before I got fired is when this war um, was waged. And I could see all of the hate speech, all of this just unfettered disinformation on YouTube and how that was impacting this um, uh, uh, these people. And again, I just could not get anyone to do anything about it at Google. Later on now with Francis Hogan and, and, and things like that, it's been on, the, there's been a lot of um, conversation about this on um, specifically Ethiopia and Facebook and, and, and YouTube and Twitter, et cetera, on the press. But when I saw it coming for a long time that I couldn't even uh, do anything, uh, get anybody to even care at all or do anything about this. And this was actually one of the reasons I wanted to write our stochastic parrots paper, which was about large language models, because some of the languages that I speak and my mother tongue specifically, and which is actually the language of um, the main language spoken in Tigray, which is the biggest victim of this war right now, it is not even um, represented in any of these large language models or any of these hate speech detection models or anything that they work on. Anyway, so this is my long sort of uh, way of talking about why it's to me very important to have a distributed approach to this because um, some of us who are so viscerally um, impacted by these things see things that other people don't see and we can't get them to care. And it's really important to um, allow people to um, kind of influence the, the way in which these technologies are built without having to uproot them from their communities and make them move to Silicon Valley or something like that. And many, many people can't also can't do that um, because of visa restrictions and so many other issues um, and cost, of course. And um, so anyhow, this is DARE and you can follow us on Twitter at DARE Institute. Um, and so let me talk about some of the values that we were thinking about and uh, the that came to mind. And this goes back to the incentive structure. So once I got fired from Google, a lot of people said, you know, of course you can't have academic freedom um, in companies, you know, that's an academia. You know, if you want academic freedom, just go to academia. And I kind of want to think through what does that mean? You know, who has academic freedom in academia? Um, there is a lot of gatekeeping in academia. I have seen um, these committees, you know, of, of, you know, when, when they decide who to hire, there is a reason why it is one of the least diverse places you can imagine. Um, 
harassment is only second to the military. Um, and so there is there is an incentive structure here where some people have a lot of power and they control other people's lives you know, forever. And um, I'm personally happy to see some of uh, these graduate students unionizing, um, adjunct professors kind of trying to advocate more for their um, collective worker um, power. Because again, if we're going to talk about ethics or AI or whatever, it just there is no way you can have anything ethical without also empowering the people to make those kinds of decisions without being retaliated against. And I, I believe the same thing in corporations as well, which is why I really support the tech worker movement. And so when, when um, I was thinking about DARE, besides the distributed aspect, so D was <laughs> distributed, that was the very first thing that came to mind. Second one was, of course, I mean, before all that, I wanted to build something that was different from academia and um, industry. So because I, I didn't feel like the incentive structures in either of these places allowed me to do the kind of work that I want to do. So for instance, um, if I went to academia, I would have to um, make the powers that be happy to get tenure, right? So they have to um, think that my work is important. Um, I have to be publishing every God knows what amount of time, like faster than my thought process. I, I can process things personally speaking, faster than um, I can carefully imagine um, the the pros and cons of what I'm doing, how I should release data, et cetera, and then move on to the next thing. And this is kind of, to me, a very um, kind of, it's unsustainable and unsustainable path. And, and if that's our incentive structure, it's again, really difficult to imagine how we would build anything ethical, right? So the first thing that we thought about is community, not exploitation, right? So uh, this is also goes back to um, why I, I didn't want people to have to move, leave their communities. I just wanted people to stay in their communities and work on things that are relevant to them, right? Because a lot of times, even in this work of fairness and ethics, etc., you see um, what people say parachute research. One group of people, and this has happened a lot in let's say anthropology or international development or something like that, where uh, academics sort of swoop into various communities and they use them as um, a talking point or an abstract kind of group of people to discuss in your paper, right? I see this in computer vision a lot of times. Uh, for instance, when people talk about image captioning, they talk about blind people and how this would be great for blind people none of the authors are blind, none of the, you know, the relevant researchers are blind or the communities um, who are the main uh, contributors of the work are blind, but we, there is all this discussion about how this would benefit blind people, or you see things like that on self-driving cars, etc. right? And then in fairness, there's a lot of this, you know, um, oh yeah, you know, you look at risk assessments and it harms black people, but then here's how we're going to solve that kind of situation. And in many of these cases, um, there's communities who get exploited, uh, whose knowledge is extracted from or who are used as like a exhibit A of some work and who don't end up benefiting from this work or don't end up, even if it's, you know, the work is valued, don't end up ascending, getting tenure based on it or getting paid or, um, or, or kind of their names being out there. So, uh, the first thing I thought about is how not to do that <laughs> with DARE. And so what does that mean? Um, that means a number of things. That means, especially when you extract data um, how to uh, and knowledge, how to appropriately compensate for that, how to appropriately value different types of knowledge. And so I um, and so that's the first that's I, I can give I'll give an example uh, about that later. But that's the first uh, one of the first values. The second one, it might be simple, but it is healthy researchers. Like I have noticed I have noticed very much in my field how everybody is extremely stressed out whether it's in academia or in industry. And it, it just doesn't matter if they had the best paper last year or whatever, they're always stressed out. They feel like they have to submit to every deadline or, you know, and it's, it's, it's just not a healthy environment. And so, and, and so I dare, and we see, you know, I saw these, um, 
a number of examples like this. So um, I, I mean, I know how some uh, some of the people in the AI lab at, at Stanford operate. But for example, publicly, there was an example where Andrew Ng had uh, this announcement of a startup or something they had, and he was like, "We regularly work, you know, eighty plus hours or ninety plus hours a week, and something like that, you know." And we were all just going like, "Okay, what? How does that?" work and also that discriminates against a lot of people and also why do we do that the labor movement gave us weekends and weeks for a reason right um and then we see these um leaders of open ai too um regularly tweeting oh here's my screen um app thing that told me that i was you know on the screen for you know 96 hours and you know why are we and, and they said you know great um, discoveries require great uh, work ethic, you know, and so I, I we want to do a, a different thing saying, no, they require healthy, um, healthy, thriving researchers. Um, and so that's kind of uh, that's that's uh, our another one of our values. And then <laughs> And then what I mean, what do I mean by comprehensive principled processes? Each time we work on a research project, we want to, we don't want to rush to publish it or, you know, uh, sometimes depending on what you're working on, there's things that are good to publish, there's things that you shouldn't do, there's things that you want to think through, how do you publish a data set, how do you do data stewardship appropriately, etc. And in order to do, and who do you involve at which, at which part of the process and in order to do that you just need a long amount of time and we need to be able to value all of those different aspects of research right for instance we wrote a paper that we published in december but we're still working on you know how to um, create visualizations who to communicate with how to make the case farther how to responsibly release the data set and create maps etc to me that's just as important as writing the actual paper it's not about just writing a paper and moving on um and then finally um when we say proactive pragmatic research, what does it mean? So DARE is an interdisciplinary research institute and we wanna do both things. The first thing is to figure out how do we develop um, AI research in a way that's not exploitative and even could pot potentially be beneficial to our communities. But also the second aspect is if we see things that are wrong, how do we stop them, right? We don't believe that this hammer that is called AI or whatever should always be there. And if and it, it's not inevitable, if like I think it was Chris Gilliard who said that um, that, you know, when we found out that asbestos was bad, we banned it, right? We weren't like, well, I guess it's there already and we have to figure out how to retrofit it. And so why is it that, you know, when we talk about face recognition or predictive policing or whatever, people talk about these things as if they're inevitable um, and retrofit them. They're like, fair this, you know, fair, um, you know, predictive policing or fair um, risk assessment. And for some things, it just should not be done, right? So we want to just be mindful of the fact that we don't believe that we're not tech solutionists is what I want to say. We don't believe that something exists and therefore should just be proliferated. Um, okay, so I talked about all of these values, but what does it mean in practice? It means in practice that I anticipate that at our institute, we will put out less work and each of that work will take more resources. Because if we're thinking through how are we appropriately compensating people, how are we not making them work to death and, and stressing them out, and how are we going to be slow and deliberate rather than you know move fast and break things, that just basically means for each of the thing we put out, it's going to take longer and it's going to put take more resources out of us to do. So that's just kind of you know what we're anticipating with our research institute. So so far um, we have. Uh, there's um, six of us, um, actually a, a seventh person uh, who is Meron Estefanos, who joined us, who's um, a direct, uh, who is a, um, a refugee advocate. 
But um, so we have Rasidja, who's our research fellow, who's in Johannesburg. Um, Shira is an advisory committee member who is in, in um, Nairobi in Kenya. Um, Safia Noble, who is in LA at UCLA. And uh, Dylan Baker and Alex Hanna, who used to be at Google um, in the ethical AI team under me. Um, and um, how we're supported is currently with these um, foundations, uh, MacArthur Ford, Open Society, Kapoor Center and uh, Rockefeller. And so I am um, talking about incentive structures. Uh, this is very important because um, currently I see that the two ways in which our field is funded is either something to do with warfare or something to do with making money for large corporations. And I just don't believe that if that's um, where we start from, uh, that we're going to end up in a different path, right? Like people say AI for social good or something like that. Um, and I was just saying the other day that to me, if you start from the idea of warfare and then you want to retrofit it for social good, that's kind of like trying to retrofit a tank. So we create a tank first, all our money, all of the you know, funding we have, et cetera, is with the, with the kind of uh, paradigm and thought of like, how do we create a tank? How do we create drones for warfare, right? And then once we start there, somehow we retrofit it and say, oh, no, let, let's try to see if we can do something good with that, right? And I think that's just the wrong. If that's what we want, then let's not start with a tank that we're retrofitting. Let's start with something else. Um, and I think many of us are just resigned to that's how, just how it is. Um, because, you know, uh, like when we think about the history of AI technology in general and, and AI or not, it a lot of it is about warfare, right? You look at the history of machine translation, you look at the history of self-driving cars, you know, and so why don't we feel like we can do something differently? Um, and so that's why we're trying to start with our, you know, for, with our little institute, we're, we're trying to think about funding. And now... <laughs> And uh, no funding is uh, cl clean is what I've learned at this point. Um, it's kind of like pick your poison. But um, so one of the things I'm super, you know, I'm really kind of thinking about for DARE is how to make this sustainable. How do we have a diverse, uh, you know, thinking about just having full-time employees and um, everybody's like life dependent on a couple of foundations is not also the best um, strategy. So I'm thinking about how do we have our own revenue stream in addition to these foundations? How do we have, you know, other kinds, other other sources of uh, funding as well? And the thing I've noticed is that, um, so when I was fired from Google for speaking up, at least there are in name some labor protections that are supposed to protect you from retaliation. However, um, if you do that in this space that I'm in right now, there's no such thing like um, and a number and um, philanthropy, there is a thing as big philanthropy, right? And also there is the same billionaires who, who got rich from large tech co corporations are now also controlling all of a lot of the money that goes into um, philanthropy. And there was just a political article about Eric Schmidt's the level to which um, he influences the US government uh, and his foundations. And so I strongly believe that we can't have the same people influencing both large tech companies and government policy on everything and nonprofits and academia, right? So we should advocate for more, you know, NSF type funding. That's not funded by Amazon. And there is an NSF plus Amazon fairness, whatever funding and, you know, government's job is supposed to be um, an oversight, right? Like there's supposed to be checks and balances between um, these different institutions. So um, when I think about incentive structures, I'm thinking also about, you know, how do we how do we think through how we're funded and how our um, how we get our money. Um, and so why did I care so much about creating an independent research institute that small, you know, our goal is not to like take over the world and become a huge um, thing. I'm hoping that we see many different initiatives like that. Um, it reminds me of this uh, our um, tweet uh, by Karen Howe, who was talking about how, you know, um, a lot of times people say, oh, you know, when these large tech companies are creating these huge models that require huge computer, huge data sets, or, you know, uh, huge resources, if, if it ends up, you know, doing something wonderful, like curing cancer or something, you know, isn't that great? Like, why are we so worried about this? And she's saying, 
No, because, you know, what technology do you know that was just even the most basic things have not been are not equitably distributed. Right. And so how what tech do you know that from the bastions of a few privileged groups of people, it ends up like a trickle down thing. It ends up then being, you know, um, successfully equitably distributed. Right. Um, and so I, I strongly believe in what she's saying, which is why I think there needs to be a lot more grassroots efforts. Um, some of these grassroots efforts that I really um, like are um, some of these examples. So here's an example of the Maori in uh, New Zealand, um, uh, basically um, using a language uh, technology for language revitalization. So they had um, a competition uh, with a local radio station to get um, uh, data right by people um, for I think it's speech related um, technology and so in a few hours a lot of people were excited to you know give their data as part of this competition so now they have this data set so a while later they had this request by um, by a, um, an, Amer a, an American company Lionbridge I believe to either license the data or to buy the data and they rejected the offer and they published a video explaining why, right? And they said, basically, this is the last frontier for colonization. Um, they, you know, the, they, their ancestors were not allowed to speak their own language in their own land. They, they were, you know, they beat it out of them, like, you know, about these residential schools and things like that, that like people literally beat it out of them. And now they want to buy their our language as, as and sell it to us as a service no right and so uh this is the kind of stuff i think people think about when they're thinking about how to benefit their communities first and foremost right so they're saying that whatever we do with this data set whatever we do with this technology it has to benefit our communities first and foremost um what what whereas if their you know goal was to take over the world with profit that's this is not the kind of decision that they would have made um, so, uh, you know, and, and looking at this, um, this whole uh, story reminded me of this uh, kind of paper uh, that I saw, I, I guess this is a, this article is a, um, a, a kind of a summary of the paper. Uh, it, it's by Amanda, um, I can't say her last name properly, but um, actually her thesis is actually super interesting too, but um, she talks about how, again, the history of machine learning, I, I mean, um, not machine learning, machine translation, and, you know, it's ties to the Cold War, etc. But in this article, um, I found this to agree to this quote that says the most important thing happening in Silicon Valley right now is not disruption, rather, it's institution building and the consolidation of power on a scale and at a pace that are both probably unprecedented in human history. And so for me, that that is why it's important to you know not just focus on like okay yeah how do we make this fair what's the impossibility theorem or math but the, that to me is like the final phase the most important foundation is to think about what kinds of institutions we're building and how we're um, structuring the incentive structure um Another example uh, that I like is um, from my former colleagues um, Ernest, Mubwaze and his collaborators at Makari University in Uganda. And this is um, uh, um, a project on cassava disease um, diagnosis. And um, basically cassava is a second larger provider of carbohydrates in Africa. And it's a very important food security crop and yields are low, especially now uh, because of uh, the climate catastrophe, the African continent you know, it, it, it hasn't contributed to the climate catastrophe, right? Like less than 3% of emissions come from that entire continent. But it is at the forefront of this catastrophe. Um, and, you know, I, I can say a lot <laughs> about that, but I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. And um, anyhow, uh, the locust invasions and all of these other issues that you see right now, um, make the yield um, lower, and it's very important to have higher yields, especially now. Um, and so it's grown by uh, many of um, smallholder um, households in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so um, 
uh, my former colleagues, they, um, and I, I, I was a little bit involved in uh, data um, annotation uh, a, a, b in a similar thing before, but um, they um, created this um, app uh, that allows farmers to surveil um, their um, crops. And um, what you can do things like, you know, you can classify disease incidents um, and the type of disease and disease severity, but there's also other types of projects where you can do, you know, counting pests on cassava leaves, et cetera. Now, why do I talk about incentive structures? Because let's say you do this work and to do it right, you have to part, you know, you have to start from the community issues. You have to start with local partners and, um, you know, partner with them. You have to take a long time to figure out how to gather the data set, et cetera, and how to, you know, deploy the apps, et cetera. And say, say you want to publish this work. If you want to go to computer vision, they're like, oh, whatever, where's that? If, if it's a data set, uh, pr uh, project though they'll say oh that's just a data set like you know data sets where's the algorithm or something or oh what's this algorithm is it generalizable you know and i've had a lot of these kinds of ex um, experiences so one of the reasons i wanted to create my own institute and i didn't want it in either of these academic or um, corporations is that if we're having those kinds of issues, um, publishing peer reviewed work, I don't want it to be a big deal, right? Like, okay, great. We think this work is important. I believe that it's good to have, you know, peer reviewed work, but like if we can't publish something for a long time or if we end up believing, you know what, I, we think it's important anyways, we can do that at our um, Institute. Um, so in us, uh, speaking of which, um, so we have this work that uh, we did at our Institute and it's a similar thing. Um, so this work is read by Rasa Josefala, who is um, a research fellow, and she's um, in South Africa. Like, like I said, she's based out of Johannesburg. And it's um, in partnership with um, um, Nella Luzango and Richard, who are also based out of South Africa. And so this work is on using um, using um, uh, satellite images to study, to analyze the legacy of spatial apartheid, right? And so spatial apartheid is, uh, uh, ba uh, you know, apartheid uh, supposedly ended in South Africa in 1991, you know, legally, but these images, aerial images show that, um, I mean, you can visually see the difference, right? So on the left, you have these um, huge, you know, uh, mansions and, and suburbs. On the right, you have um, townships and the Group Areas Act of 1950 in, in South Africa mandated that people of European descent can live in certain locations and everybody else can live in townships and uh, and they weren't allowed to live <laughs> where the people of European descent lived and the the budget was also mandated uh, to be of course much lower for the townships and so even though apartheid has legally supposedly ended you see these aerial images uh, where obviously um, the the structure of townships and and man and um, suburbs etc is um, as it is right now. So our our question is: Can we use um, you know computer vision techniques and 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 um, satellite imagery over um, to analyze the evolution of these um, neighborhoods over time and partner with um, uh, you know other people in urban studies or people who study spatial apartheid, etc. So um, so like this project, like I said, is read by Rasaja, and she lived in a township. She grew up in a township. And I, I think actually at the top, like her house where she grew up is one of these places. And so this is a very personal project for her, right? So when we talk about community, not exploitation, this is someone who's studying her own community in a way that she thinks would be beneficial to her community. She's not like swooping into some other um, community and um, like, you know, using it as an as a as a subject of her research. Um, so this is, this is a time lapse of um, some satellite imagery that shows you how things have changed. But um, so what we did is we um, <laughs> spent a lot of time, I mean, get a gather of figuring out how to annotate and gather the data set was the bulk of our first, you know, iteration of this, this project. And so here are examples of some satellite imagery in 2011, 2013, 2015, 2017 that gives you an idea of how things have changed. And so our, our question is, uh, so our first, uh, so basically we annotated um, 2011 um, satellite images with different kinds of neighborhoods. Um, and so for instance, here you can see the actual image 
of 2011 and the ground truth. Um, so these plus these small clusters are kind of neighborhoods. So we had to like, you know, we finally arrived at, you know, wealthy, non-wealthy, non-residential and vacant. Um, and so here's the 2017 actual image and inference. So our now we are trying to analyze more like what is our error bars, what are some of the other things we can do, et cetera. Uh, we're about to release the data set. But so the, some of the kinds of things we're doing are, for instance, you know, simple things like if you're looking at, you know, um, different kinds of neighborhoods. So B would be like vacant, like I said, or background. NR is non-residential, NW is non-wealthy, W is wealthy. Um, so like if we say, you know, what percent, what happened to all of the vacant land? So if we look at the first plot here, we can see that most of it stayed vacant, right? Because it's gray um, and vacant is gray, but then most of what has been built has been wealthy neighborhoods, blue, right? And so, or we can ask the same thing, like what happened to most of the wealthy neighborhoods? So if we look at, at the very end, the last plot, we can see that a lot of it stayed wealthy, so blue, um, some of it was demolished, so it became gray, and then um, yellow, a lot of, you know, some of them turned into non-wealthy neighborhood, right? So these are some of the um, question, uh, you know, kinds of analysis we're doing. And the next phase, like I said, of the project is to create maps and visualizations and release the actual data. And also we're starting, uh, we're partnering now with people who have, um, like whose, whose expertise is to study spatial apartheid. Um, and we're also writing an article on a um, outlet called Africa as a country. I don't know if you guys know this outlet. It's a, it's one of my favorite. I mean, I mean, Africa as a country is obviously like it's a satirical like title for the, for the outlet. But it's it's one of the best um, outlets to actually have a very nuanced conversation on, uh, on things related to Africa and Africa and the diaspora. And one of the main points we're going to make in that, um, in that article is actually one of the things we re realized is the South African government doesn't um uh, label townships in its census and so if you're gonna study spatial it lumps them into formal and informal residential areas and so if you're gonna study sp the if impacts of spatial apartheid you still have to label those townships because you can't pretend that they don't exist anymore and so that's one of the things we learned um through this project anyway so this is a uh, the paper if you would like to um check it out and um, I'm just gonna stop with that to answer some questions. All right, thank you, Tim Nett. Thanks. Um, so this is uh, an opportunity for us to ask uh, questions of our speaker. Um, you can unmute yourself and ask or you can uh, put that up on the chat. Um, Who wants to go first? Hi, it's Vanessa. I'm uh, actually a, an incoming student to our to the AI master's program. I thought this was an excellent uh, presentation. And I wanted to ask, is there any opportunities to do any volunteering with your group or to assist? Um, and any sort of like research just from, you know, kind of a being a, a new, new, very, very new in the field perspective? Yeah, um, I'm uh, so, you know, right now we have to build the build the first initial foundation of the Institute before figuring this out, because um, we've got a lot of questions about people who want to volunteer and one of my, uh, well, I haven't decided yet, but one of my uh, reservations about that is similar to like unpaid internships, right? So um, th that could favor people who do have the time and uh, space and resources to just do something for free to get the experience. Um, and so my current uh, leaning is that anything we do will just be paid. Uh, so we will have, you know, internships and uh, fellowships and stuff, but an avenue for those who are kind of um, starting out and to be able to work with our institutes and get mentorship 
it's something I don't feel I, it's something that I like maybe, you know, I think maybe one year from now uh, we'll, we'll start having something like that. But right now, you know, I just started it in December. I have to <laughs> figure out like some of the basics, uh, the foundations before that. One of the other things we're figuring out. Oh, sorry. Um, what were you saying? No, no. I was just going to say I saw that on your website too. That you've obviously <laughs> yeah. been getting a lot of requests. Yeah, the this. FAQs. I still need to <laughs> update the F, you know, <laughs> FAQs. But that's the number one request, and it's great. And like, I wish I could hire, but but this is the issue, right? Like with the funding that we have and the people that we have, we have to be very careful how we grow. First, make sure that we grow like this. And then what can we do next? You know, that's kind of what we have to do right now. And another thing I'm thinking about for DARE is also going back to the question of how to funnel resources to people who are most impacted. Um, also, we're also thinking about how do we incorporate people who who have a lot of experience about personal experience about the harms of some of this technology, including AI, but are not necessarily researchers or PhDs, right? So I, I gave you an example of, so we have this one project that we're working on, on, you know, harms of social media, uh, like not out of, um, similar to like when I worked on face recognition, let me tell you, it wasn't because I was interested in it. I could care. It's not like a subject I find just interesting or fun. It's just out of necessity right and so the social media stuff was basic similar to that I, I get a lot of um harassment on social media and especially uh it happened after i got fired from google but also when i started speaking up about the current war and genocide um and so i we start and you know, like I said, my friend Mahdi, who we hired, also the same thing. And we started sort of seeing all of these different patterns. And now it's a research project, right? One of the people uh, that we have working on that is Merona Stefanos, who is um, who is a refugee advocate. And actually, you can see her, uh, some of her work, um, The Sound of Torture. I mean, uh, is a is a, a documentary about her work. You, you need to be in a very... Uh, it's a very disturbing uh, documentary. It's about um, people, air uh, trains, mainly being trafficked um, in, in the Sinai. And what happens is people ask for ransom, like their traffickers ask for ransom and they torture them. And I just called like uh, there was this other guy just recently, a, a young kid who was under these traffickers and was begging for um, like uh, ransom and they put like vi this video on TikTok and you know the community has no choice but like you're not gonna not pay right but then you pay and then they keep on doing it so I literally called and it was the kid with you know in these traffickers homes like it, it's really I mean you cannot imagine the what 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 they do to these people and so Meron has been an advocate for 20 years um, like people would literally call her uh, when they're in the Mediterranean in boats, uh, like drowning. And they'll say, there's 800 people in this boat. Our lives are in your hands, you know, and, and she'd try to like figure out what to do in the next 48 hours anyway. So uh, Meron is also someone who gets a lot, you know, who knows a lot about this, but also gets a lot of harassment on social media. There's... Um, a lot of campaigns against her, her life, somebody, somebody just kind of recently attacked her in a supermarket. Like, so she's someone who's working with us on the social media harms project, because I, like I said, community, not exploitation, right? She has a lot of knowledge uh, that is very useful for this project, but she's not like a PhD student, you know, or, or, you know, professor and academic, right? So she usually doesn't get to be compensated adequately for these things or have her name out there as an expert. So the reason I'm talking about this is also, I'm, I'm you know, I'm thinking about how do we have more of this kind of stuff that's more, um, um, kind of baked into our process. So whether it's fellowships that we specifically have for people like that or gig workers or spe specific communities that are most impacted negatively by these technologies who have a lot of um, information and knowledge um, or, or what. So this is all going to just take time for us to figure out and, and um, implement properly. Yeah, they are kind of subject matter experts in, in their own yeah. sense. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. 
All right, we have several questions on the chat, so you can uh, look at them while I maybe read that out, or uh, if, the, if the questioners themselves want to ask, go ahead and uh, uh, unmute yourself. But I'm going to start with Vasan's question. Vasan Thonavar uh, asks, you said academic and industry funding models can interfere with pursuing ethical AI. Do you see similar worries about funding from philanthropies? Yeah. <laughs> I do. It's never ending. That's why I said pick your poison because, you know, um, because you, the, the, okay, so when you look at the philanthropy organizations, many of them are started by the tech billionaires from large tech companies, Chan Zuckerberg, Jeff Bezos, Eric Sch and w w Schmidt Futures. And so I'm like, no way, you gotta be kidding me, right? So I, I'm really trying to figure this out. I'm just being honest. So um, when I, um, our, our, our first, the foundations that I just mentioned, um, the nice thing is they just literally um, funded our vision. I, there was nothing different about what I, I didn't feel pressure to change this or the other, but there's a lot of issues, right? And, and so, but but this is absolutely not sustainable for me. I really do want us to to make, first of all, our own money in a, to a certain extent. Like I, I'm trying to figure out how to diversify different revenue sources. We, we, we have expertise. I think we should be able to, uh, charge something for whatever expert and figure out a way to to do that because this is absolutely not sustainable for me and then another thing you see is um so in in these you know like the the foundations are either by current billionaires or dead billionaires who actually were doing you know like so it you know i just really don't know how to and and i just learned recently that most of philanthropy is not even actually by these foundations it's by rich individual donors so somebody was telling me most people you know get this foundation money and then they want to graduate to like rich donors i'm like what do you mean like I, now i have to go make some rich guy happy is that are you kidding me i don't want to live my life like that at least the foundation there's a grant application there's what you know some kind of so you know it really is just not good um so I, i'm i really just kind of want to figure out how to how to make it more sustainable than that and then the other issue is that um so we got um general i mean i'm, I'm all the perfect all the academics on this call obviously know, <laughs> know all this stuff right you have like general operating grants versus project-based grants right so initially our our grants that we got our general operating ones which is good but when you do project-based grants um it goes back to you have to make people happy, right? Like, why did I not want to, you know, change my my direction such that, you know, somebody who's been academic for a long time wants to give me tenure because I, I, I want to do the work that I believe in. But when you start doing project based grants, then, you know, you'll see what they're interested in versus what they're not interested in. So there's um like there's a huge risk that you'll just like adjust your your sort of project in a way uh, to to make it like based on what they're interested in right so this is a huge problem i really would like to see more even more government funding you know more state levels federal level whatever it is um because i don't i don't want to now like be beholden to for, you know some you know rich donor or something uh, and so yeah uh, I mean, I guess the, the 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 short answer is yes, and it's very frustrating. I don't, I don't really know. Kind of, you know, it's just I don't know. You 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 escape one thing, and you you get you you feel like you can't escape it again. All right, our next question kind of picks up on your pick your poison situation, <laughs> uh, and asks, do you have any thoughts on antitrust legislation and the possibility of using Dare in a policy space as an independent research? I think antitrust legislation is important. I just think that, um, so, um, you know, I, I really believe in checks and balances. Like we need checks and balances. I don't believe obviously in authoritarian governments. I've been there, done that, escaped that, and that's bad. I also don't believe in authoritarian corporations. That's bad too, right? Like we get to this efficiently march towards catastrophe, right? Like the climate catastrophe and whatever. So we need something in between and we need checks and balances, right? We need checks and balances on things. And so when you have 
these huge monopolies unchecked, unregulated, completely unregulated. They, they really, they proliferate things super fast and you, you are stuck sort of trying to re remove the harms and then whatever. And then they're like, whatever, I'm moving on to the next thing. And then they do that super fast, right? Like that's where we are right now. We have face recognition. How long have we been talking about this for, you know? And it's, just, it's like just proliferating really. And then social media, how, mu how much have people been talking about it? And I mean, I'm the, the the level to which I've learned about so many issues on social media is is huge in the last couple of years. I think experience teaches you more than anything else. And then now we're not even talk like they're not even talking about social media. We're in the metaverse. I've never been in a metaverse, but like I have to now keep up with that. Like oh, we're or we haven't even done this, you know, stuff. What we need to do with this other stuff, but they can't. We're in a space where they can't do that, and that's not sustainable. We, you know. So I, I, I think anti um, uh, trust legislation is really important in terms of policy and dare. Um, you know, I we were trying to figure this out because um, I, I was thinking, like, how has my research, uh, how, how have I contributed to policy in the in the past? I've never written like policy, you know, this is what the policy should be uh, or anything like that. I've never written a policy paper. Um, I actually, in, in our stochastic parrots paper, we were debating having a regulation section, but I was just like, I think that just needs to be another whole research in itself. I don't, I don't feel like I'm currently qualified to do that, but I, I feel my papers have many times been used by policymakers. They have been cited by a lot of them. They've been used by victims too, to advocate for themselves. So I, I feel like perhaps that's where our, you know, uh, our skills lie. Um, and I do talk to so many legislators. That's the other thing. I, um, and I don't, I can't read all of their hundred, you know, page thing and give like line by line kind of, uh, you know, uh, this is what I think, this is what I don't think kind of thing. I do give my general opinions about general kind of directions and things that I see. Um, eventually, we might have a policy person at DARE. Um, I think if we do want to really engage, we, we should. But um, currently, this is, this is what we're sort of doing. But we talk with, <laughs> we just talk with so many uh, offices and agencies and stuff, and we want to help them. And, but the thing is, you realize that the corporations have people who do this all day, every day for lots and lots of money. That's, they pay them to do that. So they're whispering in their ear all the time about what's the problem with this legislation? How is it going to harm innovation or how is it going to harm Google, whatever? And it's very difficult to compete with that, right? And we need to, it, it's, we, we have to be in those places and give a different, um, kind of version of how we think things should be. Um, so, but again, like how exactly we do that effectively um, is something uh, I'm thinking about. Another thing I'm thinking about is that, so for instance, there are other organizations who've been very at, on top of like all of the policy proposals and things like that. So for example, I was talking to people from various organizations, like Access Now or other organizations who are telling me about the EU AI Act and things they're worried about there some specific um, provisions and things like that. And I was saying, okay, well, you know, let me, um, I can give you maybe some um, information or some of my research that might help kind of combat that, you know, or, or, or talk about that. So that's been how I feel like we've been involved thus far. And um, we might have at some point in, in the future, probably have a, a policy person. It takes so much time. Like, let's say they ask you to testify in Congress, you got to write your testimony you know, for for a while, and then you'll be asked by senators and things like that. And Matt, like, how can you do that? And also research <laughs> is a very, you know, and also build an institute like um, at the EU, I had a five minute appearance, and I had to figure out, you know, how to use that, that time wisely. Um, and what what major things I had to say. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It's it's just something. Um, maybe we uh, another thing we're thinking about is like building some sort of coalition, right? Um, with various other organizations. Um, and and so some people might have looked at you know particular legislation a lot 
um, a lot more carefully than others, and maybe there's some how, some way to to support. But you know, I don't know. I guess we're gonna have to figure this out. Thank you. Thank you for your responses. Uh, we are at the three o'clock hour, which means we are closing out this portion of it, um, uh, and then we will have a discussion hour following this with uh, students who already submit some questions. Uh, so I let my co-organizer Fred um, say a word of thanks to everyone. Yes, thank you everybody for participating. And most especially, thank you, Timmy, for taking the time to, to come and share your thoughts with us on such an important topic. I'd like to thank you in the name of the Center for Social Responsible Artificial Intelligence from the, and also from the College of IST and from Penn State in general. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And then as a reminder, Shen, so we're going to move to the discussion with the same link. Yes. In the same Zoom link. Um, and there have been several questions that people have submitted and others who are interested are welcome to remain uh, in the discussion. Uh, we are happy to have you. And uh, Tim Nitt has kindly agreed to um, stay back and uh, answer more questions. So that's that's wonderful. All right, so um, we can continue on here at this point. And uh, I don't know if um, the people who asked the following questions uh, are still around. Emily, are you still around? Emily C, yeah, you're still there. So maybe you could just um, uh, ask a question or I can ask it for you. Um, Oh yeah, sure. Sorry, I can't have camera on, but um, Timnit, thank you for your presentation. I actually, um, I've been following you since you left Google, and I wanted to ask you actually on your perspective on corporate doublespeak and ethical AI, because we know this, everyone knows this, ethical AI is not ethical, especially with how we outsource it to a lot of different countries. So I wanted to ask you in your time and experience, I mean, you're currently reacting, but like, do you think it's actually possible to have ethical AI with how we are currently making it? Because corporations are what are making and advancing AI technology. Can it ever yeah. be ethical? Okay, so you know why I rolled my eyes was that um, when um, Meg Mitchell, my former colleague, called um, the team she started at Google at the, the ethical AI team, it, that was the only team that I heard knew uh, I think she coined the term ethical AI. And um, I remember like we used to talk about this and we got irritated with AI for social good. And we're like, what does that mean? Can we, it means we can also have AI for social bad or like, does it mean that there's AI and then there's AI for social good? Like we want, you know, to, to start with like the assumption that all of it should be, you know, it's set to, for social good, right? Um, so then she called it ethical AI because we think AI should be ethical, period, uh, or AI development should be ethical, period. And then speaking of outsourcing um, to uh, other countries that you were talking about, th like this article that just made me want to pull out my hair was um, there is this article on time uh, by Billy Perigio, who, who, who also did a profile on me. And this article was on Sama. I think Sama used to be called Sama Source. And so this company, I had heard about it a long time ago. Their idea was to hire a lot of data annotators and other people in um, developing countries um, to you know, give them jobs, but they will not be paid that much or whatever. Turns out um, a lot of Facebook uh, content moderators for Facebook um, in Africa are hired through Sama. And um, this article was particularly about uh, this, this group of content moderators in Kenya and how they were treated. I think they paid them, if I'm not mistaken, like literally $5,000 a year. I, I, I'm pretty sure that's like, uh, I, you know, yeah, but just a ridicu ridiculous um, number. And they treated them, I mean, like, uh, you know, you had to make a decision on a video in 15 seconds and you get tracked like you can't blink, you can't rest, you can't, you know, there's no mental health support. I'm I'm currently going crazy looking at social media stuff. And if it wasn't for my research, 
I would completely disconnect from Ethiopian and Eritrean social media stuff, mental health wise. It's, 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 it's not great. Right. But imagine the content moderators who are like filtering all this stuff. And so eight Ethiopian content moderators quit like, and this is during this whole horrible conflict that I'm talking about right now that is, we don't even see about in the news. And so this company calls itself an ethical AI company <laughs> somehow, right? So I'm like, come on. So at this point, I don't even like using the word ethical. I'm like, let me call it something else be because it's it's become that thing. And when you say double speak, it's so interesting because I now know, you know, back that uh, uh, people used to say this a couple of years ago too, like whatever, how can you do, you know, uh, ethical and corporations and things like this, it's a lost cause. And I would push back a bit, well, we have done this thing and we're trying to do this thing, you know, um, but I've really absolutely come to the conclusion that the only reason they're really, really interested in it is to guard against regulation. So how they use our work is um, let's say for instance, Congress, when I got fired, Congress right, right, uh, and a bunch of Congress uh, people and, and senators write a, a letter to Google being like, uh, we're, we wanna know about large language models. How, what are you doing? What are you doing about this, about that? And then they'll write back and say, we have hundreds of papers on ethical AI and we, you know, we fund blah, 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 blah. That's what they use it for, right? Um, and so the thing that will really have teeth they fight like with all their might, right? And because that's that's the only way we can get, I go back to incentive structures, the only way we can get everyone on the same page and to get them to calculate, to, to change their calculations about what they should and shouldn't do is regulation. If you're allowed to put out an unsafe product and make a lot of money, you're just going to continue to do that. You're not going to be like of your own volition, be like, okay, you know what? If I make 10% of the revenue, uh, I can actually make this thing safe. And if I slow it down, I'm going to uh, make this thing safe. Uh, and so I'll just make that decision for myself. It's not going to happen, um, right? Like there was uh, Mar Hicks, who's a tech historian that I really like and learn a lot from, wrote this um, uh, op-ed on uh, Wired saying that Facebook's fall from grace during the whole Francis Hogan thing looks very similar to the big three, um, the auto companies um, in, in uh, American auto companies in the 70s. And so she, uh, Mar was drawing um, parallels. And so same thing, right? They were saying, oh, it doesn't cause pollution and you know, we don't need seatbelt laws and this, that, you know, it took many, many years. And finally, you know, uh, there was regulation and Ralph Nader had to come forward, et cetera. So, so anyhow, um, so yes, I think it's 100% um, double speak. And I think the, the, the silver lining <laughs> in me being fired is that I, I feel uh, like more people are starting to think that way now. Um, there's also a paper called the Gray Hoodie Project. Um, from people at University of Toronto that talks about that draws parallels um, between big tech um, and um, big tobacco and um, and how the big tobacco companies used to do similar things, right? And so um, in that sense, I think you're 100% right. It's corporate devil speak. On the other hand, so can um, AI be ethical? I I think it, it, you know, I mean, AI itself is just a thing, right? So I think it's a tool. And so people make it, ethical or not ethical. And so we that's why we have to process, uh, focus on the people and the processes by which these things are built and what they're built for. Uh, and in terms of doing things in the inside, I still 100% believe in worker power. And I, I think that can make a huge change, which is why all of these companies are um, fighting with their all their might you know, unionization, right? And so whatever form of collective worker power that people can build, that can, that makes a huge difference because you can fight back, you can, you know, have strikes, you can say, I don't want this to, you know, I don't want like to work on this. Um, and this has had a lot of impact in the past, right? So uh, Polaroid workers in South Africa, right? Like that had a lot to do. Um, so Polaroid was a, you know, was being used in South Africa, like during apartheid, right? And, and they were perpetuating all of all of these issues. And a lot of 
uh, Polaroid workers brought attention to this. We we're striking, we're doing all sorts of stuff until they pulled out. And then a number of other companies were pulling out. And this is huge. So I still think that workers at, at these companies can make a huge difference. Um, but I think that first they have to build organizing power. And that's the real power. That's the real thing that'll make ethical AI, which is why these companies are going to fight it. You know, they're going to fight it to death. Yeah. And, and I think you also talked about environmental dimension of ethical AI. And so mm -hmm. it has, yeah, even beyond the- kind Absolutely. Of the so like, um, you know, in the environment, um, so we talked about it in my, in, in, in our Stochastic Parrots paper, but another thing is people say AI for climate change or AI for climate or something like that. Um, and, um, and again, it, it strikes me as, you know, again, the hammer thing, like AI is a hammer. So let's, let's go find the, 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 the nail. Whereas, I mean, we should start with the problem, right? It, the problem is climate change. If AI can be helpful for it, sure, great. But but if you really look into it, what is the number one thing that AI is being used for? The number one thing it's being used for is to number one, surveil oil and gas companies, right? And make them efficient. So, I mean, like, if you really look at that, I don't think AI is helping with, you know, climate change. And then that's beyond what we're talking about in terms of um, large language models and stuff. And, and let me just say, since you brought this up, I mean, like the, <laughs> the, the paper we had, Stochastic Parrots paper, Jeff Dean, I mean, section three, like he just, just, it was like a, a, you know, tape that was stuck or something like section three, section three just kept on saying, you know, I'm like, what about section three? What do you want to change? You know, this was the environmental financial cost section. And he just hated this section. And after I, they fired me, he literally spent his, his Christmas break working on a takedown paper. People told me about this. I mean, like, I, I, this to me is so, you know, bad on so many levels because me and him are not like equal researchers debating things. You know, I work for him and he used his power to silence me. And then he wants to use his other scientific power to put out a paper that is reviewed internally by his subordinate who also by the way, wanted, to, wanted me out and wanted my, my paper to be. And so finally, they like published this paper. I don't, obviously, I mean, I'm obviously not biased at all, right? But I, not, not a good paper. And Jan LeCun is like, hey, you know that, you know that, you know, the, the, the stuff people are saying about how AI is an environmental disaster in the making, total BS. And he links to the Google paper. And I'm like, Hey, like, have you seen a paper from Facebook AI about how like literally e AI is an environmental disaster in the making? Like, aren't you the leader of Facebook AI? There literally is a paper that they just came out with, with all sorts of analysis. And they said, I, and I quote, the environmental footprint of AI is staggering. That's what the paper says from Facebook. But, but these people are like, so want to say this is not true that he'll put his own team under the bus like who wrote this very I thought you know very a paper with a lot of analysis I'm gonna link to it actually um so you know I just if you start from the assumption that this thing should just exist and like you know we have to retrofit whatever I think you'll just kind of try to defend everything at all costs I'm going to link to this paper because I couldn't even believe it. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know about this Jan Lekun statement, but yeah, that is somewhat uh, revealing. Yeah. Um, he also says, oh my God, I, I just, oh, right. Like, uh, you know, disinformation, Facebook. No, it's, it's exaggerated, you know, <laughs> like. Right. That was the, that was the official line for a long time, I think, till, till fairly recently. So, um, so sad. Um, and they were I'm going to find the paper, but yeah. That's okay. Let's move on to uh, other questions. Saptarshi Sengupta, you're next. Do you want to ask your question or do you want me to ask your question? 
Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, Dr. Gibru. Uh, th that hi. was a fantastic uh, presentation. Um, so yeah, I had a question which probably bounces off of the, the stochastic parrot paper. I have yet to go through it in complete detail, but that's on my reading list for sure. So um, whenever I played around with these kinds of uh, generative models, like let's say GPT-2 and stuff like that, um, when I fed it, let's say adversarial examples, it turned out that, you know, it, it, st it starts uh, you know, generating really questionable kind of text and questionable material. Yeah. yeah. So um, my, my, my thing is like when we uh, refer to these kinds of models as like they are bad or they are, you know, doing something which is, uh, you know, against what societal norms pre like predicate, stuff like mm -hmm. that. I'm I'm kind of on the fence of of saying like we are kind of anthropomorphizing these kinds of models and mm -hmm. saying that the they exhibit some sort of human behavior whereas they're basically just you know statistical machines which like mm -hmm. you know picks up on the probabilities of how you know text is distributed throughout a corpus of uh, you know uh, literature and stuff yeah. so so I'm I'm just wondering whether there's a misconception whether how on how we look at this uh so is it is it correct to say that these models they are biased or something or is it is it the data which is ultimately generated by human beings that are that are biased, that is biased so that's my uh you know con con conundrum here yeah i think in the in our paper mm -hmm. uh we make the case like that um we make a number of cases so i think you might be interested in section six <laughs> so okay. like okay. okay so um we talk about in in detail the platform the the, the way in which the data that is used mm -hmm. it, it, you know what that reflects right which views it reflects um why there is a misconception that because there's a lot of data that it's quote unquote diverse. We say size doesn't guarantee diversity. Um, we talk about the moderation practices of a lot of these um, platforms that exclude certain many groups of people. To start with, only certain groups of people have access to the internet. Like, and so we we talk and we give lots of examples. Like, for example, if you talk about ageism, like a lot of older people who talk about issues of a uh, ageism use blog posts mostly rather than you know. Uh, anyway, so we we give a lot of examples there, and so mm -hmm. then. Then we say, okay, so now imagine whose data, whose like views, worldviews, et cetera, are represented. It's it's the hegemonic dominant uh, view in, in certain places. And then we say, what happens when you create models based on this kind of data? Why, what are the harms? One of the things we say is there's a, 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 a risk for extremism, for instance. And why is that? Because now this is where the linguists come in, uh, my collaborators. Mm -hmm. uh, my collaborators talk about how you attribute, like when you communicate, you attribute uh, intent uh, of, of what you see. When you see a bunch of text that's coherent, et cetera, you think it's, you, you kind of imagine who it's coming from. Mm -hmm. So you imagine that it's coming from another person uh, with certain characteristics, even when it's not, right? So, um, so for us, I think it was important to be specific about what harms we're talking about and why we're talking about harms. Like um, there's also another paper from the same person, Amanda, about um, how a lot of times when people talk about bias and whatever in, in, in um, NLP, uh, they're not super specific about it and why it's important to be specific. So we never like in our paper say the model is sexist. Uh, mm -hmm. We say like, you know, why, what kind of harms, you know, how using this model can perpetuate sexism, right? How, okay. Um, okay. you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I, I do mm -hmm. agree with you when people say that something like this model is racist and this model is sexist, um, you know, maybe you can kind of uh, be shorthand for this model outputs racist and sexist text. That's what I say. The output of this model the text that I see mm -hmm, is mm -hmm. racist and sexist, yep. but the model is racist and sexist. Yeah, you're right. Like that then goes to like, uh, oh my God, this conversation that people started having saying, it might be that large language models are slightly conscious. I'm like, oh, yeah. I don't, I'm not, I don't, I don't know. I'm not going to go there, but like, <laughs> but I, I totally agree with you there. I, right. I, and so I think it's important to be specific about what we mean uh, mm -hmm. when we say bias. And when mm -hmm. we say harms, when we say this, that, 
Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm in agreement with you. And I think in our, in our paper specifically, mm -hmm. we talk about why these kinds of texts um, being output, why mm -hmm. they can be harmful. Like we give right, some examples. Right. One of them is like the attribution of who it's coming from. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, from my linguist, um, you know, collaborators who have references and things like that in cognition. Absolutely. Gotcha. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, our next question is from uh, Maggie. Maggie, do you want to ask a question? I've pasted your question on the chat board. Yeah, so um, no. Yeah, thank you, Sean. I actually cannot remember <laughs> it's like that wording I used to ask my question. So I guess my question is pretty uh, practical in the sense compared to the previous question, but this is something that I read about when I take like an NLP class that people are arguing that, you know, if we are solely focusing on the biasing to a point that there's no any bias in the models anymore, then there's no accuracy or no meaning in the model because that's not representing human or it does not have meanings. So I think there's something off with this argument and I wonder how you think about it and do you think this is true or um, do you think- um, Yeah, how I, you yeah I, I just, again, I, I'll go back to the specifics. I One of the things that really irritated me, like, about conversations on large language models and why I actually wanted to write a paper. I actually did not want to write a paper. I wanted Emily Bender to write a paper. And then can you imagine how things might have gone differently if <laughs> I asked Emily Bender if she had a paper on the topic? She told me no. And I said, you know, look, all these people at Google are asking me questions. I keep on pointing to your tweets and like whatever. If you actually have a paper, it'll make things a lot easier. And she was like, why don't we write one together? And I was like, I'm not a, I'm not a linguist or, you know, I'm not an L NLP, but you know, like, so anyways, we ended up writing one together, but, um, but one of the, the um, reasons I wanted to do this was because the conversation was just so abstract in, in a way that just didn't have meaning to me, right? Like just people are just talking in such abstract terms that makes it difficult to like like talk about real people, real harms and real situations, right? So in the abstract, I can say, and there's also overloading of bias. People will say, well, a model is supposed to discriminate at some, of something. So if it can't even discriminate, then like, that's what is it doing? And then of course, like, yeah, at that abstract level, like we can have those conversations, but to me, it's meaningless. So now when I'm talking about, you know, real issues and real harms, um, I really want to link this paper. I'm gonna uh, find this paper that I mean by about how we need to be super specific when we say bias. What are what kind of bias are we talking about? When we say harms, what kind of harms to whom? In what way are we talking about? I think that's when we can have actual real conversations, right? So then you say you can say, look, if we have an NLP model, that's why in our paper. We don't talk about, we talk about one of the things ways forward we talk about is curate your data for a specific thing, a specific use, right? Like think about the downstream applications. There's things like dual use, et cetera, right? There's ways to uh, think about these things. But this idea of general, general generality is I think a big problem, right? So like general purpose X, general, and then they like, we'll just use all data from the internet and it's totally fine like oh it's too big we can't curate we can't document you know so when you at, at the very least you got to start with the understanding of like what is your data what what is it being used for what can you document and then you can say what are the pros and cons what are the things we can you know like take versus not take like what's okay versus not okay etc right now we're not even like at that point so um these conversations about debiasing, et cetera, to me, when they're super abstract like that, it's very difficult to have real conversations. So I would point to this paper <laughs> that talks about why in, in NLP. And it, so this paper did an analysis of a lot of NLP discussions on bias and stuff and how like they don't mean anything because they're not specific. They're not talking about specific harms or specific what bias in which context. And so I would say, you know, let's bring the conversation down to earth and talk about like 
specific harms and specific people and specific use cases. I'm going to find this paper one second. <laughs> I think we actually um, we do um, uh, we do cite it in our paper, so I'll find it there. We can uh we 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 can take other questions. I'm just okay. finding this right. paper. <laughs> well, one, 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 two, four, yeah. So our next question is from uh, Chris Chen, who has a kind of a double part question. So Chris, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Thank you, Professor like Timmet. Uh, yeah, I'm I not really, a professor yet. Yeah, sorry, uh, Doctor Timmet. Thank you, <laughs> thank you <laughs> for really appreciate that title. Your talk. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I'm so impressed by your like gender shade study as well as your proposition proposal for the data sheet, data sheet for the data set that inspired my dissertation work. So thank Amazing. you so much. Amazing, thanks. Yeah, I'm just curious about what do you see about the meaningful ways for lay users like us to combat the algorithmic bias issue? Because I know there are a lot of solutions from data scientists, but that's oh. not workable for, for lay users. What do uh, you think lay users can do? to solve this issue? So, you know, I think a lot of people know when they, when something doesn't sit well with them or they don't, it, it, it's creepy or it's harmful. Um, you know, like, it's really interesting. I, I, I promise you, I think this, this has a connection, but it might sound super random at some point. Like I was listening, you know, there's a, a podcast I listened to called Radio Lab. And uh, one of the episodes that they had was about um, uh, the very first kind of ideas for candid camera, how like they would uh, get people in their private moments and stuff like that. You know, candid, like now we're all used to like reality TV and just kind of, but they were interviewing people and, and they were talking about how people were not okay with this. This was not okay. You are violating people's privacy. There is a difference between something on screen, on camera stage and like, you know, doing this to them without their knowledge. Like it's not okay, right? People had that understanding that this is not okay. And so, so for somehow we're now like used to it, it's okay. And so I think that people know when something is wrong, like when they don't feel like this is okay, they don't need to know the ins and out of how stuff works, right? So I would say, you know, so if you think about something as if it's, it's, if you don't think about something as if it's just inevitable, we can't change it. So whatever, I'll, I'll just like go along with it. Whereas like when you feel like, you know, it's not okay for your privacy to be violated, it's not okay for, um, you know, social media um, companies to, you know, have this much or whatever, when you when you feel these things, you can still advocate. So for instance, um, you know, you can look at what kinds of um, legislations are being proposed um, locally, or, you know, um, even um, it's state Senate wide, etc. You can try to engage there, you can educate yourself and others like so for instance, there is like, documentaries like coded bias right just you know be more aware raise more awareness around people so that collectively then i think you know in, in your small kind of circles you can do that right and then that can percolate but i think what i want to say is that you know and then you can follow like certain organizations and see what they're advocating for so like ai now is one um you know a day i mean we're not advocating for much but you can you can learn more about what what we would advocate for um these independent institutions, algorithmic justice league is one and so for instance when um the government was using id.me for the irs was using id.me a number of us signed a letter describe and and joy bolomini wrote an op-ed describing why we don't you know agree with this right and so you can kind of try to like learn a bit more about these arguments so that when people kind of tell you something, you can you can sort of say something back, right? And so I think kind of trying to advocate for more transparency and laws and understanding the harms, right? You don't have to be an expert in the ins and outs to know that, you know, unregulated technology shouldn't exist in the world the same way that unregulated medicine doesn't exist unregulated cars don't exist you know this is the only industry that is getting you know away with 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 just no regulation whatsoever that's my my point of view 
Yeah, thanks for your insight. That's very helpful. And I think my another question is about like perceptions, different perceptions between different ethnic groups of how they see AI. It's maybe yeah. like for ethnic users or minority users like me, we experience maybe experience some discriminations in real life. We may have high trust in AI. So when yeah. it shows like bias, then just like, well, piss us off or become so angry about that. Yeah. So, so do, do you see this difference? Is this true? Because that's just my hypothesis. Yeah, you, it's true. Actually, some of the talks I give, um, they start exactly from that point of view. So I give an example. Maybe I'll show. Oh, I don't have it here. Um, oh, actually, I can show you really quickly. Um, so in our tutorial, so we have a tutorial uh, beyond fairness in computer vision tutorial. And uh, I'm going to find it here, tutorial. Um, and just give me one second, uh, or fate CV tutorial, sorry. <laughs> um, and it's, it's like this tutorial is about, you know, fairness and computer vision, et cetera. And, uh, and we have three, um, we have three, oh, geez. Okay, so we have three um, like lectures. So the first lecture is, um, I'm really gonna find it, sorry, one second. Oh, no it's, worry. <laughs> it's maybe 2019. Um, the first lecture is about like who's benefiting and who's, who is not, um, and, or 2020. Oh, who's benefiting from computer vision and who's being harmed? Um, that's the question. And, uh, oh yeah, there you go. This is it. So when you look at um, the slides here, I'll just kind of share really quickly. Um, the first thing we talk about is, uh, yeah. So do you see this? Yeah, yeah. Right. So here I have two excerpts. So here is uh, from James Landay's book called Smart Interfaces for Human-Centered AI. And he writes, imagine for a moment that you're in office hard at work, but it's no ordinary office. By observing cues like your posture, tone of voice, and breathing patterns, it can sense your mood and tailor the lighting and sound accordingly. Through gradual ambient shifts, the pace, space around you can take the edge off when you're stressed or boost your creativity when you hit a lull. Imagine further that you're a designer using tools with equally perceptive abilities at each step in the process. They riff on your ideas based on their knowledge of your own creative persona, contrasted with features from the best work of others. Sounds like a great office, right? With, and then here is Ali Al-Khatib's um, understanding of the same situation. So this is an excerpt from him, Anthropological Artificial Intelligence and the HAI. So he writes, someday, you may have to work in an office where the lights are carefully programmed and tested by your employer to hack your body's natural production of melatonin through the use of blue light, eking out every drop of energy you have while you're on the clock, leaving you physically and emotionally drained when you leave work. Your eye movements may someday come under the, secure, the scrutiny of algorithms unknown to you that classifies you on dimensions such as narcissism and psychopathy, determining your career and indeed your life prospects. Not great. <laughs> so the moral of the story is based on where you are in society and what your experiences are, you're going to have completely different outlooks about a specific technology and how it may harm you. Because most of the time, the people who have known, been harmed before by, you know, power structures, they're not at the top of the food chain, are the ones who are going to be harmed, right? Like, so mm -hmm. a lot of people talk to me about like how, oh, they don't care about privacy, you know, because, you know, they're not, they don't have anything to be ashamed of. Well, you're not being targeted by authoritarian regimes. You're not a dissident. You're not the recipient of genocide. You're not a member of LGBTQ plus community organizing in countries where it's criminalized, you're not, you know, so this is not about the culture of privacy. This is about being being targeted. 
um, or people who in the States who were born and raised in Detroit, right? The most heavily policed um, city and also the blackest city and all that have been, you know, surveilled to the death will spot, you know, these surveillance techniques and say, we don't want this. Whereas people in some suburbs and stuff don't want their Amazon package, you know, stolen. And so they'll have that ring camera, or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, this is exactly why I really do not think that you will convince someone in power to change their mind because they haven't experienced it. It's not in their benefit to change their mind about these things. I think that what you need to do, what we need to do is build coalitions and power among the people that do believe things need to change such that then they can affect change. So that's why I believe in collective worker organizing unions, et cetera. I don't believe that I can go to a Google VP or CEO or whatever and say, do things differently <laughs> at the cost mm -hmm. of, you know, whatever, because it's not in their best interest. But the people who have experienced things, who know that things need to change, can can form coalitions and build power, then they can affect change, right? So this, what you said is because people have vastly different experiences and vastly different imaginations of the future based on that. Yeah, thank you for your answers. Yeah, that's excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those two excerpts that you showed us was one was the ideal technocentric view, the other was the Black Mirror episode. Yeah, James mirror. Landy hates it that I do that. He was like so <laughs> mad at me. I'm like, sorry, I... like you wrote it, <laughs> you know? But the, yeah. there's also these other nuance to the Chris's question that I got, which is that it's also among the minorities that you look at AI as kind of um, uh, the D system, the incontrovertible system. So they might attribute uh, kind of more uh, credence to it or more credibility to it as a result, the people who are biased against are the ones who uh, will feel like um, they are somehow um, imperfect, um, even yeah. though they, because they start with the premise of wanting to overtrust AI. Yeah, exactly. This is another problem, right? Um, is the problem of, uh, we talk about this in our paper a bit, the problem of automation bias, where um, you can, you know, so one of the examples that we give in our stochastic parents paper, which covers a couple of things, which is one, how these uh, models don't give you any cues for when they're completely wrong. So like machine translate. I mean, the other day, Somebody, uh, I wrote in Tigrinya and, and the, 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 somebody wrote on Twitter in Tigrinya and the translation was, oh, you know, like our forefathers have this um, saying that, you know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, just something. And Twitter, first of all, detected the wrong language and then gave a completely coherent, it's a Google translate that they use, completely coherent translation saying, literally it says we reject these allegations in the strongest terms or something like that like i have absolutely no idea how they came up with that translation has absolutely nothing to do with the text that was written and it's completely coherent so you don't have a cue that this might be wrong right and in our paper, we give an example of an, a, a Palestinian guy who wrote good morning on Facebook and it got translated to attack them. And the uh, so he got arrested because people didn't even see, you know, what the original non-translated version that he wrote was. <laughs> so one of the things I was working on at Google was a project that I had set up and I, I still wanna work on this on that specifically that issue, how can people interface with, you know, so we have data sheets and model cards and stuff, and that's also about transparency. But what about the end user, the person who's interfacing with these AI systems? You know, uh, when you look at like Facebook Translate, for instance, or Google or, or Twitter, you know, even translating, they barely let, it's not like they're letting you know, hey, be careful, this is a translation, you don't, tra they like barely make it look like it's translated. They want you to think that it's not, and it's horrible. Right. And so and so I think that um, knowledge when an automated system is is involved in something is super important. Um, so like I actually, you know, the, I, I met with some people at Wikipedia because they're working on a, 
on model cards. They have model cards for all their different models. And they asked me like, I was like, what do you use models for? So for instance, when they, when they say this article is a stub, so it help improve it, whatever, some that, like many times that could be a model. And I was like, it's really, I think, useful for people to know that this hap a model said this. <laughs> I mean, like not an editor or a person. A lot of times we don't know what we're interacting with. So I think that's really important. Right, right. And it's often the minorities who do not have the, who don't feel empowered to question these things or look under the hood. Yeah, and exactly. The ones who um, take it for granted. Yeah. And um, I think that. Uh, um, people have come with different terms like in, de in design and HCI. I think people talk about my friend um, is working on what she wants to call tinkerability, allow people to tinker with the results that they're getting or interact with it or um, con contest, allow people to contest, you know, results or, or whatever they're getting from these models. Right. And I think that's an important part of, of this. Yeah, very much so. All right, next question is from uh, Yuan Sun. Um, Yuan, if you want to unmute and ask your question. Uh, yeah, um, so again, thank you for a wonderful talk and it's very inspiring. Um, so I'm just thinking about that you mentioned um, that uh, your work is basically uh, will bring like more awareness of the ethical or the biased issues from AI, but I'm, I'm also feel it's really paradoxical that on one hand that we want uh, people to trust the AI system, like uh, so that the AI can help users to make decisions. But on the other hand, when we kind of warn or inform users about these potential issues, um, like what we call in the psychological, there is uh, something called negativity bias, like maybe users hold neutral trust or neutral stance toward this AI systems, but once they know that there could be some possible uh, issues with it, like uh, biases, people just like uh, algorithm aversion, like they um, refuse to use it anymore. So my question is really like, how can we make sure that um, these opposite or these situations not happen? Like people can um, put appropriate trust um, yeah, yeah like nice. calibrate their trust, because what we want is not just for people to trust, we want for people to calibrate their trust. So the issue right now is that that's not possible because half the time you don't know when an algorithm, when it's a model or not. So you can't, you know, so you're being deceived, basically, you think it's a person or something, right? Um, half the time, uh, we don't have appropriate documentation or, or appropriate interfaces for, you know, what like what we should expect. Um, we're in the middle of, in my view, very bad science and very bad engineering, because in engineering, you would, you know, like test out all of the different fault tolerances, all the edge cases and all of that and do documentation and all of that. So my paper on data sheets for data set came from that background, like, you know, uh, in electrical engineering, like there's data sheets <laughs> for all components and their standards and there are all sorts of stuff. We don't have that. Uh, we also are not doing the thing in science where we have a theory and we're testing it with experiments. We have a sound theory. We're not doing that. We're, we just kind of put out papers and baselines and it's 1% more like than on the benchmark. So it's out, you know, and so I think in order to have appropriate calibration, we have to do better engineering and better science. And that means also better like interfaces like what we talked about, you know, for instance, um, on, on machine translation, if if people worked a bit more on like, I have a I have no idea what to expect. Like, like I said, there was Tigrinya and it was just like a random thing, you know, and this could be used by anybody for anything. Imagine uh, immigration, right? Like they're not, they, they use this, this kind of stuff. There's all sorts of cases of Google Translate being used. Imagine in um, hospitals, right? Or, you know, so I think what we need is we need <laughs> regulation, we need um, lots of work around transparency, robustness, you know, how to test things appropriately, where to use things, et cetera. Whereas now it's just out there, you know, you may even, you may know or not know <laughs> that it's out there. Um, and so then we can't calibrate our, uh, our, 
are trussed appropriately. Great, yeah, thank you. All right, our next question is from uh, Pejman. Pejman, do you want to unmute yourself? Uh, yes, of course. Thank you very much, Dr. Gabriel, for your wonderful talk. This is extremely inspiring for me. Oh, uh, that's my, great. <laughs> my question is rather philosophical. I was wondering if you think AI uh, can reach a level of self-consciousness one day that it can detect biases in its own performance and potentially even correct them. Wow, it's like automated bias detection. I I just like can't imagine <laughs> that happening. I mean, you know, I I like you know we are. I, I, I don't even under, you know, people work on um, AGI, right? Artificial general intelligence. Like, I don't understand A, why that's a goal and B, what, I don't get it. Like, because for me, that this is my, my motivation for stuff, right? Um, also, actually, I never thought about it. I just thought things were interesting and I just did them. Like, I literally didn't step back and, and think about stuff, right? But, um, Either you want to, you know, build tools that you think will help us in some way, or you want to understand things, you know, how things work. Um, like, I don't know, is the, is the, I mean, I'm being super philosophical here. Is the goal of physics to build a new universe? Like it's not, right? It's to understand the universe, right? Why do we want to build a new universe? If we can, like, that's not a goal that we're doing. We're trying to understand things. So maybe the goal of AI could be, is there a way in which can we understand intelligence and how it works? That's one goal. Um, and then another goal can be, can we you know, build tools that um, help people in some way through automation? That's another goal. Can we build an artificial general intelligence thing is like a weird goal for me. It's kind of like, why is this? something we want to do even. Um, and then so when I so right now, um, you know, there, there has been a huge hype in AI, right? But when we look at the methodologies, like, certain things have changed, but the method the the foundational things we're talking about are the same from a long time ago, right? And now we have, we have, we, we have achieved certain, you know, accuracies on certain tasks. Um, but like, I don't, see how that is related to consciousness in any way. So I don't know if you've read Emily Bender's um, paper called Climbing Towards NL Climbing Towards Natural Language Understanding. Um, so a lot of people talk about large language models, uh, are, you know, saying that, oh, it understands stuff. And we're like, no, it doesn't understand stuff. But then she has a whole paper making arguments about why, right? Um, so to me, I just don't see how we so the first point is getting to consciousness and then the second point is like automated automatically correcting itself like i can see how you know you can when you talk about models uh you can bake in some kind of regularization which is what we do right like in your loss function or in your sort of optimization or whatever you have different kinds of goals that you you specify or even if you do reinforcement learning you have different kinds of rewards right um for, for different i can i can see those things but to get to but like i cannot imagine you know getting to a point where like you're conscious and you're like you know reverting like correcting your biases if you're conscious then why are you why would you correct your biases too like what do you think now what's your goal like is your goal to serve humans like what's i, I don't know then we get to like why why would i do that like i don't know but but anyway so i guess i think for me that gets back to like the philosophy of i don't even know why, why agi is a goal for me i'm i'm not in that in that camp yes thank you very much i was <laughs> i was thinking quite a bit about the applications of ai in in the judicial system oh um, yeah yeah interesting yeah yes but thank you thanks for your response mm -hmm. all right speaking of bias we have a question from magdalena uh is that the person with the hands up too or magdalena are you there do you have your hands up Oh, I don't have, I didn't put in a Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, I saw Hua have our hand up, but if Okay, Magdalena, Magdalena do you want to say your question? 
Okay, so she's not able to. Maybe Kim, you want to go next? No, I think you... she said, didn't she? She unmuted. She Magdalena. Unmuted? Magdalena. I thought... no, that that oh. was not from me. That question. I'm sorry. Oh, that oh, sorry. question okay. is not from you. Okay. Oh, did I get to get it from the wrong place? Okay. All right. Sorry. I think that is already answered then. Okay. Uh, all right. That's my mistake. Uh, let's go to Kim's question. Kim uh, talked about her being inspired to come to see us. Hi. Actually, my parents are refugees and my grandpa actually went to concentration camp. Oh, wow. So one of the reasons, because, you know, I grew up in Vietnam and we faced like, you know, many, many wars. Yeah. So in undergrad, I have like a math bachelor mm -hmm. and one of the reasons that led me to see us now is that i know that if i don't the people yeah. who came from my family's background our lives are going to get shaped by the technology that are created by the dominant group yeah now i'm like in a master's at georgia Tech in mm -hmm. cs and one of the things that strikes me is how hard it is to bring an interdisciplinary like knowledge even from math even from statistics yeah. into computer science because almost like the people who are in industry a lot of times do not take into the implication they, you know you give them a system and they just optimize the systems right but they're yeah. not thinking about like the methodology of why how where and even within academia, like I'm starting to see that crossing in like the industry academic yeah. like partnership. So how do you think that we can go about to, I think this current generation is almost a lost cause now because they went through a very like stereotypical CS, like systems optimization education. If yeah. you have like a magic wand, how would you change like CS education and CS research or like collaboration so that people don't have to like basically learn psychology and linguistics yeah. and then learn CS to have a voice in the in the room, you know? Like, well, is there a way we can make I it an open source gave a talk platform? exactly about this. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, I'm going to find if, I, if there are slides of my talk. I, I gave a talk. My entire talk was about like literally this specific thing. And I, do they have the slides? Um, I've been giving this talk for a long time uh, because it was it was something I noticed. Let me find it. Okay, oh, well, I guess there is, um, I think this is a recording of it. I'm not sure if there's slides. So here's a recording of it, um, I think. So it's called the Hierarchy of Knowledge of Machine Learning and its Consequences. A hierarchy of Knowledge in machine learning, sorry, machine learning and its consequences. So um, I talk about how there is this intense um, pressure to not do what you just did, which is talking about, you, you know, your your history and, 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 you know, why you care about this stuff, like not bring your personal self into it and especially if it looks like something to do with caring about society like that's not good you need to be like this re removed um, you know engineer or scientist I talked about that um, I talked about um, and then I, I I talked about interdisciplinarity <laughs> um, and I said that um, this attitude, um, is something that feminists, that scholars call the view from nowhere. So um, this attitude that um, science and the way that we are taught and engineering and math, whatever, is, is some truth out there from no, one, no one's point of view. And, um, and like, actually it is from someone's point of view, not just not you. <laughs> and for them, that someone is, is normalized, right? And so um, my number one thing I say is that that view from nowhere, attitude needs to change from CS education completely. Um, um, and then the second thing I say is that um, when we talk about interdisciplinary, and it's a gatekeeping mechanism, uh, you know, when we talk about interdisciplinary, and so I talk about the history there. When we talk about interdisciplinarity too, um, there are some things that are acceptable. So I give examples of 
game theory. So for instance, in generative adversarial networks, you know, there's ideas from game theory, theory uh, physics-based models like, um, you know, in graph-based uh, stuff. And so there's some things that are cool, uh, inter in interdisciplinary like it's cool to do this but then there's some things that are not okay and like that's because of the hierarchy of knowledge right and so um my conclusion was that the educational system needs to change to remove the view from nowhere a kind of attitude um and then that when we talk about interdisciplinarity uh different kinds of disciplines should be equally it should just be valued and that um people from other disciplines need to be given power uh, because um, a lot of times, um, you know, in computer science, if uh, people have power, like they will not have to be interdisciplinary truly, like they'll just kind of bring in someone, you know, um, in order to have that, like people from other disciplines need to have power and they, so they need to get the funding, they need to get the uh, resources. So that was my conclusion. You might be interested in the talk. My whole talk is about that. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I might write a blog post about it. Like somebody asked me if I have a post about it. I don't know. We'll see. Bye, Andrew. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have, uh, I guess, time for one more question. Hua, Hua Shen, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, thank you, Professor, and thank you, Dr. Gibru. So um, it's really, I uh, appreciate your amazing talk and actually your work also inspired a lot on my AI interpretability work, like the model cars and the data sheets. Awesome, thank yeah. you. Yeah, <laughs> and so we're talking more about the AI-centric, uh, human-centric AI. So one behind motivation uh, was that like we can observe the gap between some AI algorithms and some real applications uh, on the human. For example, uh, in our previous uh, study, we found that when we do apply some AI explanation methods to the real human, like end user human studies, we find that actually some AI explanation method are not useful or helpful for yeah. the human's yeah, judgment or some decision making. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's a very interesting uh, observation. And my question is basically about, have you also observed these similar phenomenon or issues in the fairness study? Because there are yeah a lot of AI algorithmic, uh, al algorithmic like fairness research or methods. So is it? Yeah, mm -hmm. so um, here is, I think, um, some stuff that might be helpful. So here is one paper called what practitioners really want in fairness versus what is written in the papers. So um, let me see if I can find it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so a lot of times that that's the thing about like doing work in the abstract without working with the domain experts or like thinking about the end application, right? You can do a whole bunch of stuff on this side um, that like doesn't actually help people, right? And so there's one work like that, but then there's also other stuff. Um, I guess this is something I talk about in the tutorial that I mentioned earlier, um, is that people rush to make things fair without thinking about the actual thing. Should it even exist? Like, you know, and so there's a, a lot of ex examples of this. For instance, face recognition related, like gender recognition is one. Um, people in the trans community have like talked about how th these automatic gender recognition tools should not even exist, like they're super harmful and this and that. And so if we listen to them, that would be a done deal. That's it. Don't do it. Whereas we didn't. So this thing gets built. Joy and I write this paper, Gender Shades. Um, and then they're like, oh, this paper showed that stuff is not fair. Let's make it more fair. And then you have this whole slew of things. Um, like IBM created the diversity and thesis data set had to be taken down. It's in a lawsuit. Um, you know, it's just like to make things fair. Right? Like, and so, so this rush to just do something without really thinking through, you know, who it's going to benefit, who it's going to harm has created a lot of things like this. Um, and, you know, um, using the compass data set, I mean, so let me show, let me see. Um, let me, uh, let me, uh, let me find this. <laughs> Sorry, um, there's a number of papers here I can I can um, 
uh, suggest. So practitioners, right, here is impro improving fairness and machine learning. Uh, what do industry practitioners need? That's one. Mm -hmm. um, and then this is the other one about, you know, using this data set, like just without thinking about this very harmful data set. Um, so let's see, um, Christian Lum. Um, so yeah, uh, huh. I can't find this paper, but this is, I think this is one of, it's a very important paper that I um, tell people to read all the time. So, um, all right, here one, here's this one. Um, um, and so Christian in particular, actually, if you can find it, mm -hmm. did a tutorial in 2018 mm -hmm. at FACT, the conference FACT, and it was a tutorial on uh, pre-trial detentions. So she had someone, Terrence Wil Wilkerson, who was um, wrongfully convicted, uh, wrongfully arrested uh, for something he didn't commit because of these risk assessment scores. Mm -hmm. She had his Liz, his public defender, and Christiane, as a statistician, was talking. So she was talking about the gap. Like all of these people are using this compass da data set without ever talking to someone who's actually been a victim without knowing anything and, and how they can be further perpetuating harm in the name of fairness. Um, and so this paper um, is, is, is one of, uh, uh, she's involved in it al along with other people, I think is, is a good example um, of that too. And I've heard also like, uh, I've seen some papers from other people who work more on interpretability about how so many of these interpretability methods are, you just don't know if they're even working or what they mean. Like there's a paper, I think that's called sanity checks on saliency maps or something like that, where like, yeah. uh, you know, and so, yeah, I, I just, um, oh, cool. so I have seen a lot of this rush to make things fair without really thinking about what that means or who would, would benefit. Yeah, thank you for the amazing link and thank for that great answer. Thank you, thank you all. Um, just FYI, we do have a resource uh, list coming up on our website, on the Center for Socially Responsible AI website uh, very soon. Um, we are compiling pretty much a lot of these papers, links to these papers, uh, and much of what doc Dr. Gebru mentioned uh, will be up there on that, uh, on that resource list um, with links to the uh, copyright hold order. Excuse me. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gebru, for spending, um, for being so generous and spending two full hours with us. We really appreciate your time. I'm sure my our students join you um, in thanking you. Join me in thanking you. Um, hope you have a great rest of your day. And thank you all for staying back and for all the stimulating questions and discussion. Thank you, everybody.